Hey everyone, welcome to a video on the contents of a Neo FPS scene. Here we're going to be taking a look at all the objects that you'll find when you explore a Neo FPS scene that work together to drive all the systems and features of the asset. I'll put some timestamps in the description so you can skip to the relevant parts, but otherwise let's just dive in. So I've started off in the demo facility scene here in Neo FPS samples, single player, scenes, demo facility. This is one of the more complex and complete demo scenes, so it's a good place to see everything working together. And first up, since it's something that helps us navigate and understand the different scenes, at the top here, we've got this README object. I mentioned these in the Getting Started and Hub tutorial, but essentially this is an overview of the contents of the scene, which allows you to ping and find the relevant objects and prefabs, both in the project view and in the scene itself. Here's the character prefab that spawned, and then here's the folder with all of the different weapon prefabs, for example. Inside the scene, we have things like the firearm testing group, uh, with different targets, pickups, props, and all those kind of stuff. So you can use these as another jumping off point for understanding the contents of a scene. Anyhow, so the majority of things we're going to look at in this video are completely optional and just enable or improve various features in Neo FPS. The only thing that you actually need for Neo to work in your scenes is the combination of a spawn point and a game mode. For most of the feature demos in the single player samples, uh, let's actually make that a bit easier to see. So here in samples, single player prefabs, you'll find a prefab called simple spawner and game mode. So we could disable the spawner setups in the scene here and drop in this guy. There you go. So this is the one thing that you need to make a scene work with new FPS. This is a spawn point and game mode on one object. So I can hit play mode and we get our character spawned in the scene and off you go. So generally most projects with new FPS, you're going to be working with spawners like that instead of dropping the character directly into the scene. Now there's a few different reasons for this. One big one is the fairly obvious one that it enables respawning when you die. Some games might want that, while some might not. But the other really important reason in single player games is scene persistence. This is a feature that uses the save game system to save certain data such as health, inventory, ammo counts, which are then loaded back in for the character on spawn. This means that you can create sequences of levels that the player progresses through instead of essentially resetting each time and treating each scene as a separate uh, entity. So yeah, what all of that essentially involves is a spawn point. This is the object that you see here in the scene. Moving it around and you'll see it intersect with the ground here. And then there's a few different options for shape, including none, which will essentially force the character to spawn. And then the character controller will attempt to depenetrate from any objects that it's overlapping with. You can also place multiple spawn points in the scene. All that requires is a game object with the spawn point component. So you can have as many of these as you like in your scene, and you can also activate and deactivate them at runtime. So for example, as you move through a level, you can use waypoints to deactivate the spawn points earlier on in the level and then activate new ones. And then if you die and you respawn, you'll do so further along in the level. So that's all you absolutely need. You can also, as an alternative, if you really want to, bypass the spawning system with a prototype character. So I can drop this one in here, for example. And then the one difference is that this character has a prototype player controller component attached. So normally what would happen if we go back to the spawner here is that we'd spawn this character in the scene and we'd spawn this player controller. And then the system would attach the two together at runtime. The controller is persistent. So when the character dies, that controller is detached from it and then attached to the new character that spawns. In the prototype character, the two are tied together. But again, this loses a number of features and functions that you would want in most games. So I do mainly consider this to be a prototyping tool and not the proper production setup. Anyway, that's spawning. What else do we have in here? 
So next up, we'll have a look at something that you're going to be using in the vast majority of scenes, and that's the hood and menu canvas. So I've separated that out, the canvas and the event system, into two separate prefabs. That's just because you only want one event system in your scene. So doing this allows you to add your own canvases to the scene without having to mess with the demo prefab. So for example, you can either delete this event system prefab from your scene and use the one on your canvas, or you can remove the one from your prefabs and just share this one between all canvases. So the HUD and menu itself is split in two. We have the in-game menu. So if we go back to the game view, then this is the menu up here. Hitting play, and then if we hit escape whilst the game's running, then we can access these settings, like uh, the graphics, input settings, like mouse sensitivity, and so on. You can also take you back to the main menu and the save menu and things like that. The menu UI also handles things like pop-ups. So for example, I have a quick options on the forward slash button by default, and this gives you quick access to some of your settings, like your volume, your mouse sensitivity, V-Sync, things like that. Things that you'll likely want to finesse as you play, so you don't have to go digging around in the menus all the time. Those same pop-ups are used for keypads, uh, confirmation dialogues, and info pop-ups. So for example, we can run up to one of these. And yeah, that's all built into the in-game menu here. So here we have nav controls. These are the different navigation buttons on the left that let you uh, find your way around. And then we have the panels. And these are the actual contents of the different pages. So settings, save menu, and so on. Now the hood, so this is your crosshair, your health bars, uh, all of the on-screen information like that. Most of that is in this fade object. But the one thing outside that is the hood scope. But essentially when the scope is raised, then everything else in the hood should fade out. So everything else is under this fade object here with a canvas group, uh, so you can set the alpha. So here we have crosshairs, progress bars, health, and so on. And everything here is architected as a one-way connection. So the crosshair connects to your character's inventory, checks for a weapon switch, and then connects to that weapon via events and properties. The character, its inventory, and the weapons themselves, none of those have any awareness whatsoever of the HUD or how any of this is implemented. You could drop the HUD entirely uh, and replace it with something completely different, and the weapons and systems will all behave exactly the same. You're essentially free to take these HUD elements and duplicate them, modify, rework to your heart's content without risking messing with any of the systems that they represent. And yeah, we can also see here under the object these different sections. So these have layout groups to organize them. For example, for the bottom left one here, we have the health counter, shields, inventory item counter. So what this means is that, for example, the shields meter here will try and connect to that system on the character. And if it doesn't find it, then it will just disable the object. And then the vertical layout group will reposition everything else around it to fill the gap. Most of the features of Neo FPS are represented within this hub prefab here. So in your own finished project, you're probably going to want to clean it up and just remove the things that you're not actually using. Another thing to point out is that these hood components are generally very, very simple. For example, where is it? The, uh, the health counter here. So most of these just have properties like an output text field. All of the layout is done with standard Unity UI components. So you're free to structure all of this as you like without being too constrained. The, uh, the progress bars, they are a little bit more fiddly, but most things are just an output text component or an object to activate or deactivate. So yeah, that's the, uh, the HUD and the UI. Up next, we have the scene save info. This is what ties the save system and your scene together, sets up the scene so that it can be saved and loaded with the correct hierarchy and the correct state. If you don't have this object in your scene, then you won't be able to save the game. And this component allows you to register any prefabs that you plan to instantiate at runtime and want to include within your save games. That means things like the player character, weapons, projectiles, and so on. In the getting started video, I showed the managers, including the save game manager. You can register your objects there as well, if they're gonna be available in all scenes. But that means those objects will always be loaded into memory so that they can be accessed quickly whilst anything registered with this scene save info 
will only be loaded into memory along with this scene. You can drag and drop your prefabs individually into the Add Prefab field, or you can drag a folder from the project hierarchy to the Add Folder field, and that will register all valid prefabs in that folder and any of its subfolders. Alongside that, we also have the display name. This is what will appear in the Save Game browser. Uh, same goes for the thumbnail texture. Now this is actually a fallback. Depending on your settings in the Save Game Manager, the save system will actually attempt to take a screenshot of the game when you hit save, and then it will attach that to your save files. If that fails, or if you've disabled it in the settings, then this thumbnail texture will be used instead. Uh, next up, Scene Pool Handler. So this one is completely optional. Um, this is any pooled items, such as your bullets, shell casing, debris, things like that, which you want to reuse and recycle en masse instead of constantly instantiating and destroying. Now, I say that this is completely optional, but if you don't have one of these in your scene, then it will be created and populated the first time that it's accessed via code. That can be an expensive operation. So it's not entirely uncommon to see showcases where somebody's running around and fires a shot. And the moment that that shot hits something in the scene, that first time, there's a brief hitch before the sparks and the debris start flying. Adding a scene pool handler into your scene beforehand means that the population is done on scene load. So you never get that hitch while you're playing. Settings wise, you just have the default pool size, and then you can add the objects that you want to pool here. This is just like the save system. Drag individual prefabs into the add prefab field to register them, or drag whole folders into the add folder field to register all valid prefabs in that folder and its subfolders. Also like the save system, you can register your prefabs in the pooling manager, and those prefabs will always be loaded into memory. While here, they're only loaded in for the duration that the scene is loaded to. Okay. Another thing you might have noticed as we've been clicking around and looking at all of these different objects is that a lot of them have this Neo Serialized Game Object component attached. This is what ties this object, its components and its hierarchy, into the save system. So root objects in your scene need to have this component attached if you want to save anything in their hierarchy. And yeah, this just tells the relevant components when to save, and then it provides a reference point to tie the correct components back to the save data on load. For pooling, for example, that means that any bullets in the air or shell casings and the like will be saved. So you fire a rocket, you hit save, and then when you load the game, the rocket will complete its journey, explode on impact, deal damage, and all of that correctly. But you'll also see this component on characters, weapons, interactive objects, props, all kinds of things. Right. Now, before we leave the demo facility scene, there's one other thing to have a quick look at, which is the physics setup of the scene itself. One of the features of Neo FPS, one of the things that it lets you do, is to use separate physics colliders for the character locomotion and the shooting or interaction. We've all played FPS games where you uh, peek around a corner, fire a shot, and then your bullet seems to hit an invisible wall right in front of your face because the colliders are much, much rougher than the render geometry that you're looking at. So Neo FPS gives you a way around that by optionally splitting your levels into rough and detail physics layers. So for example, the rough collider of this cargo container here is just a box primitive. Your character will bang into it, climb on top of it, and that's entirely as much detail as you need to achieve that. Meanwhile, the detail collider is essentially the full render geometry as a mesh collider. Now your first reaction might be, wow, that's going to be expensive, you're insane. But the way this works is by placing all of those detail colliders on a separate physics layer that's set to ignore all collisions with itself and all other layers. So you're not going to get any overhead from rigid bodies banging into this and performing collision response. Instead, it's only available for ray casts and things like that. So this is one of the main reasons why it's important to make sure that you use the Neo FPS Unity settings tool to apply Neo's required settings. So you don't accidentally have these objects adding a ton of physics processing to your scenes. But in all my testing, the performance penalty has actually been fairly minimal and the results can be incredibly worthwhile. It is, however, completely optional. 
If you don't want to split your colliders, if you're targeting devices where you need to keep everything super optimized, or you're creating a, a very large scale open game, then you can just use the default layer for your scene colliders. Characters and bullets will both collide with default, whereas characters will not collide with environment detail and bullets will not collide with environment rough. Okay, so we're on to the last thing, and that's looking at the managers that Neo FPS spawns at runtime. So I've got one of the demo scenes open and running here, and if we expand this don't destroy on load subscene, then you'll find an object under here called Neo FPS managers. Attached to this, we have various runtime behaviors that do things like track the plugged in controllers, or do various time sensitive things that can't be done from the manager scriptable objects. Underneath that, in the hierarchy, we have things like audio pooling or the different visual effects when you shoot things, stuff like that. But the important point here is that if you have NeoFPS in your project, this will be created whenever you hit play. It doesn't matter if there's nothing Neo related in your scene, it just assumes that at some point you're going to want to make use of it. Now, if you happen to have NeoFPS in a project where you're not planning to make use of it, um, I know a number of people who like to create master projects, for example, with a selection of different assets in that they can use as a basis for any new projects. If that's what you're after, then there is a way to prevent new FPS from creating these objects on start. So to do that, you need to head to build settings, player settings, and then near the bottom of other settings, we'll find a section called scripting define symbols. Here, you want to add a new entry called Neo FPS load on demand. So that's an underscore instead of space between each of those words. And then to separate out the different entries in the list, you use a semicolon. These scripting defines are passed to the script compilers and allow us to switch on or off different sections of code. In this case, I'm switching to a completely different behavior in Neo scripts when this tag is detected. So it won't be obvious in the demos, but if I were to create a new empty scene, and now I hit play, we don't get any of those managers appear. This new behavior means that they will only appear the very first time that you try and access them. Now, this might mean a noticeable hitch at that point as they need to be created and initialized, but they will be full accessible from that moment forwards. So for example, you spawn in a Neo FPS character, that character contains input handlers, those handlers check the input manager and the input manager will be instantiated at that point. Anyhow, that should have been a pretty thorough breakdown of all the things that you're going to find in a Neo FPS scene. Hopefully that was helpful. If you have any questions or comments, then hop on the Discord. It's the best place to come to get support, and you can be part of the community of game devs making use of Neo FPS. Cheers, everyone, and I'll see you in the next video.